nanohub.org. Online simulation and more for nanotechnology. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, one of our own. Uh, I won't mention that Ephraim is now the most senior member of the faculty. <laughs> Oh, well, I did mention it, didn't I? So, <laughs> uh, Ephraim received his bachelor. He's uh, a guy from Brooklyn. And if Yay. you long enough, you'll, you'll understand what he's saying. Uh, he received his bachelor's degree from Columbia, which is obvious, right? In 1963, and then he moved on to, he, he got some, uh, I guess he was well-educated in Columbia and decided to go and get a degree in Philadelphia. So he moved to the University of Pennsylvania where he got his master's and his PhD. Uh, he then spent some time at the Institute for Nuclear Theory at Washington and then Institute for Theoretical Physics in SUNY and he's been at the Niels Bohr Institute in Copenhagen. Uh, and then he came here in 1979 where he's been uh, started as assistant professor. I assume it was assistant. Right. It was 1970, I was an assistant professor. Yes. Okay. So then he moved here and then rose to the ranks and is now a full professor. Uh, he's a fellow of the American Physical Society and has been recognized by the American Physical Society as an outstanding referee. Um, so I, I just relate a, a story the first time I ever heard of Ephraim Fishback. Uh, where's Andrew Mugler back there? It was in the 80s, Andrew. Uh, I was a grad student at the University of Wisconsin, and there was this paper that came out about the, I said at that time, the Edvosh experiment. I, I understand it's pronounced differently, but uh, so, you know, we looked at this paper, and it was Fishback, and a bunch of our grad students, we got together, and we said, oh, you know, we can, let's try and duplicate this and see. Uh, so we spent some time doing that. It was interesting and fun. Uh, but, of course, it was... Uh, not really something that a grad student would tackle, right? So other more smarter and more uh, seasoned people uh, went off and did these various experiments. So Ephraim was intimately tied to that. And is this the 50th anniversary of, of, of that publication no, for the fifth force? It's the, more like the 40th, OK. 40th. Yeah. <clears throat> so today he's going to tell us about the Erkverse paradox enduring the significance of that most famous experiment. Thanks very much, John. Thanks for <clears throat> this. This is uh, going to be a discussion of, let's say, first let's get a point here, of what we know about tests of the weak equivalence principle, the idea that all objects fall at the same rate in a gravitational field. You all know this. There's a long history, but I want to uh, add, I like to <clears throat> inject some humor in my lectures where possible. All right, here's a cartoon of Galileo <clears throat> dropping ball from the Leaning Tower. The balls are far apart, and he says, I sh it shouldn't happen this way. I'll have to alter the data, OK? Now, the joke is on Harris, who, did this, who wrote this cartoon, because in 1994, there was a meeting around centering on the subject on the fifth force in Pisa, of course, where the tower is. The tower was closed at the time, but Anna Nobili, who ran this conference, arranged for people who were to get dressed up in period costume and literally drop balls off the, cat, off the leaning tower pizza. You couldn't do that, but just for these people. And it was like 9 in the morning, busloads of people had no, had no idea what was going on showed up. And they did this experiment. Now, the joke is, as astonishing as it seems, they tried various combinations, same size, different mass, same mass, different size, whatever it is, different composition, same composition. And you know what? By the naked eye, this is exactly what it looked like. Without corrections, that's what happens if you drop two balls off the Leaning Tower of Pisa. And they took films of this, and I'm trying to locate the film. Only at the very end, to show us that physics really works, they dropped two balls which are compensated in the right size or a density, blah, 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 and they actually sort of fell at the right acceleration. But it's astonishing. We looked at it and said, duh, is this really what's supposed to happen? And uh, this picture turns out to be exactly what it looks like. So it turns out that Galileo probably didn't do this to deduce the famous fact that all objects fall at the same rate. We think he did it by looking at the motion of chandeliers in churches. But I think this is funny, because it looks like a cartoon, but it really is a description of what happened. Well, the, the various things were test carried out by Galileo, well, supposedly Newton, Bessel. Uh, and then the, we're going to talk about the experiment that Erdvers did in 1908, people continuing to um, 
uh, make, make more, more and more precise measurements of this. And then we go into the period following our work when people started making the even more precise versions. And I'm going to test, I'm going to describe all this. Uh, all right, so the basic idea is, uh, goes back to a paper by Li and Yang in 1955. There were, at the time we got into this project, some discrepancies in measuring gravity down deep boreholes in Australia. And we decided to look into this and see whether there's something wrong with Newtonian gravity. We're motivated by a very interesting paper by Li and Yang, who made the following observation. In addition to electric charge, which is strictly conserved, and which is the driving force for electromagnetism, there's another quantity in the world which is equally conserved, and that's baryon number, the total number of protons and neutrons in an object. No process has ever been seen where proton number or baryon number changes, whether you look at it in protons or quarks. But these guys raise the question, how do we really know there isn't a long-range force associated with it, as would be the case with electromagnetism? And they went back to this paper by Utvush, which is the one I'm going to talk about in detail. It's hard to see it, but they said, well, these guys didn't see anything. It's a one-page paper, and that was it. But we went back and looked at this in great detail. John, where are you sitting? Where's, all right. I'm going to ask for the first question at the end of this thing. I'd like you to tell, there's an interesting story about this paper, which I'd like you to remind me of. There are a lot of interesting stories, but this paper is very interesting. In any case, we followed this paper and said, well, uh, <clears throat> now, in the, in the inter inter intervening period, we're motivated by the fact that various people have suggested new kinds of gravity-like forces. OK, is it by Fuji? I'll just run through a bunch of them quickly. You know, Gibbons and Whiting. These, we'll see a bunch of curves like this, which give constraints on that. Don't worry about it now, uh, some more. Um, now, how do you construct a, not a new theory? Uh, let's start with gravity. Uh, you're all familiar with the gravitational interaction. I differentiate the potential, derive a force. The force looks like this. What's characteristic of gravity is that the force in the, on an object one uh, well, the force depends on its mass. So when I get through dividing through, the acceleration has no reference to object one, and that's the naive description of the equivalence principle, okay? Also, in terms of its R dependence, it varies as one of R squared. Now, we're going to describe a lot of theories which fall into another category. Instead of it just being uh, gravity like this, gravity is modified by introduction of some constant which depends on the compositions of the attracting and attracted masses. You can write the force that derives from this by taking derivative and so on. The, the, this coefficient over here uh, allows for the fact that these other interactions needn't just be as 1 over r squared. They could fall off with some faster range. A lambda is called the range of the force, and it's basically the Compton wavelength of some new particle which is responsible for all of this stuff. So if you look at this side of the thing, you recognize that the, what replaces the Newtonian concept of gravity is now some function which depends on g, of course, depends in some way in the compositions, and depends on space in some different ways. So what's critical over here is that this is not independent of the nature of 1 and 2, and points to some new fundamental force. And either the variation with r, or the fact that it depends on composition, are two deviations from Newtonian gravity that we're going to look at. How do we construct a theory like this? Well, it's really easy. Uh, you don't have to know field theory to recognize a simple Feynman diagram. We have two particles, one and two. They interact by exchanging some particle, which has a mass of mu. And the interaction associated with this would, would exactly be of this form, where alpha is some new fundamental constant relative to gravity. And lambda is, again, the range. Now the lambda is given by a formula. It depends on the Compton wavelength of some new quantum. If you're in the world of electromagnetism, the quantum is light. The mass of the photon is zero. Land is infinity, which means that you get the 1 over r squared force. Uh, otherwise, for some other interaction, you get two kinds of deviations. One is that the interaction in general depends on the nature of the objects. And two is that it falls off with distance, not as 1 over r squared, but it's some complicated thing, depending on uh, the range of whatever quantum or quanta are being exchanged. All right, uh, you can get up in the middle of the night and write down this theory. Uh, how do you construct such a theory? Well, you know, high-energy theories pull together a bunch of numbers uh, from the hadronic world. I have a hadronic scale at 1 GV, the Planck scale, which is associated with gravity, 10 to the 19 GV. Their ratio is a well-known number, 10 to the minus 19. You take that number and multiply it by any of the masses you find around. You get some new mass scale, which is 10 to the minus 10 EV. And if that's the name of mass of some quantum, its range is about 2 kilometers. And that's what makes it very exciting, because that's the range over which 
we live, okay? There would be some deviations over the world in which we live. Or you multiply it by something in the weak interaction model, you get meters. So basically, the natural scale of numbers gives rise to new forces, which would actually vary in a funny way over the dimensions of this room. And that generated lots of papers, not dependent on us, but long before we came into the business. Now, <laughs> we'll see. In a, well, that, that uh, I'll, I'll tell, answer that in a few minutes. Okay, don't worry. <laughs> uh, it's not my fault. This is going to be the answer. All right, we're going to see a lot of these curves that we call constraint curves. All data uh, can be put on a, all relevant data can be put on a plot of the strength of this interaction, but on the logarithmic scale alpha, alpha as a function of the range of the interaction. So we're going to, let's get used to what these curves tell us because the final results are these. Uh, every part of the curve that's uh, any part of color is excluded by some experiment or other, and we're going to look at a lot of experiments. Uh, the best limits are from biggest scales of planetary data, where, this cur where this, uh, these curves plunge way, way, way down. Uh, shown over here are uh, not, what we knew in 1981 before our work, what we knew in 1998, I picked that as an arbitrary thing. I want to point to this distance over here. This is 10 meters. When we first started doing this in 1986, uh, Newtonian gravity could have been, believe it or not, could have been wrong by 10% over 10 meters the size of this room. So when I gave lectures on this in 1986, I said, Throw in your, uh, go back and hand in your copies of Halliday and Resnick, they're wrong. If they say Newtonian gravity works, duh. Over 10 meters the size of this room, it doesn't. We don't know that it does, let's put it that way. It turns out that this scale is the most difficult scale to uh, probe because there are people in the room. There are all sorts of perturbations and it's very hard to get good results. But in any case, by 1986, we've improved it a lot. And these are current limits. You see the various experiments. Uh, Characteristically, every system like planetary motion has a best value in some range corresponding to the natural scale of the uh, solar system. To get down here, you have to look at something where you can do measurements over 10 meters without being perturbed, and that's kind of hard. Uh, but we'll talk about this in more detail. All right. As I said, and as John introduced, and I, as a result of some perturbation, something going wrong in Australia, uh, we decided to take a deeper look at all, so, all of these data. And the surprise is when we went back to this Earthbush experiment, which I'm going to describe in detail, uh, we found that when you plotted the data, we'll show that, yeah, we've plotted, I'm going to go back and describe this in detail, but let me give you a heads up. They measured the accelerate dif differences a whole lot of objects. So let me show you this schematically so you understand what the experiment looks like. We'll talk about it in more detail. They have, you have two samples here shown to be rotated this way, uh, copper, over here in aluminum, it turns out that they're trying to measure the acceleration difference. Because of the fact that the Earth is rotating, this actually leans out in this way. So if they want to fall at a different rate, it causes a torsion about this fiber, and this is what they measure. Now, this looks like it's very crude. But this technology perfected by Earthwash in the picture on the first slide was the way oil was explored for between the 1900s and the 1940s all over the world. They built these apparatuses. It was a significant contribution to the economy of Budapest. And probably my grandfather had oil in his car that came from somebody who used one of these apparatuses. OK, let's describe what the end result, what we actually found. I'm going to do in detail. If you plot up all the data for the various things that they measured, uh, these are the acceleration differences in their units. It's called delta kappa. Delta kappa is the fractional acceleration difference compared to gravity. Okay? All these acceleration differences should be zero. They should all lie along this red line over here. But you find, in fact, when you plotted the data, that they lie along this line over here. So the difference between the slope of this line over here and the slope of this line over here is what the signal is. And it turns out that that turns out to be an eight standard deviation discrepancy from the predictions of Newtonian gravity. Uh, I'm going to describe in detail more of what we've done, but this is the thing which caught attention. So this is the paper we published. By accident, it was the first paper in the first issue of Physio of Letters in 1986. And uh, this is now what the apparatus actually looks like in the case of Erdvosh. 
One sample is over here, a reference sample of platinum is over here. The torsion fiber is over here. This looks like something from the ancient world, but in fact, it's an extremely precise instrument which couldn't be beat for many, many decades by other technology. Now, of course, we have things which are equally good or better, but this is what the apparatus looked like. And as a scale, the typical apparatus is about my height, the size of a typical height of an uh, individual. All right, now to answer uh, the previous question, uh, in fact, uh, the name Fifth Force was not ours. Uh, let's see if it's in the Times. Yeah, here it is. Uh, the answer to your question, Young, is that this is the two days after the paper was published, this was the front page issue of the New York Times. Hence, a fifth force in the universe challenged Galileo's findings. We never called it that, but that was their, their guys did that, and it became, it stuck. So this is generically, this is their work, and uh, describes in detail. Here's a picture of objects falling. Here's a leaning tower. Of Pisa, which you just introduced. Okay, here's a blow up of the of the picture. And this is a whole description uh, uh, description of us. We had nothing to do with that name. That was uh, printed by the New York Times. So, uh, all right. So, I say the original fifth force because at the end of this talk, there's this X17 particle, which itself is calling the fifth force. So we're the first fifth force. So there's they're the second fifth force. If you keep track of it, we'll all be uh, have fun. All right. So now let's write down and describe in detail how this fifth force is represented. Here's the potential from gravitational interaction of two objects. Here is this new force. It's written in exact analogy to electromagnetism. F squared replaces E squared, the electric charge. Uh, barrier number one and barrier number two, well, that replaces Q1 and Q2 if Q were the charges. And now we allow for this force to have a range because it could be transmitted by objects which have a finite mass, which means the force can be uh, uh, of any size, and in fact, our group here at uh, Purdue and RUPUI, we've tested things down to the nanometer scale, nanometers, and at the other end, you have galactic scales and so on. So let's allow lambda to be whatever it is. And so I simply combine these two by uh, just factoring out G1 and M2, just rewriting all of this. The new interaction looks like gravity modified by some constant, which you're trying to determine. And because you're measuring the acceleration, it's the barrier number divided by the mass. We use the notation that mu is the mass of something in units of hydrogen. So these numbers B over mu uh, are the relevant parameters where everything's normalized to the mass of hydrogen, which is one. And so this is what the new interaction looks like. So here it is. Hydrogen mass is the normalizing thing. And we're looking for the presence of this. How? Because the potential is going to depend on B1 and B2. If B1 is the Earth and B2 is a whole bunch of samples like this over here, the acceleration difference is going to depend on the difference of B over mu for whatever samples are being used. And uh, the scale is set by uh, the mass of whatever it is. Now, by now, we're going to come back and look at these nails. But right now, uh, if you look at all kinds of experiments, we've excluded all sorts of uh, all the green stuff. Uh, represent values of the co uh, constant alpha and the range. Notice how many orders of magnitude from 10 minus 21 to 10 to the 15 meters are covered by a bunch of very, very clever, hard to do uh, experiments. Uh, we'll look at this in more detail, but different kinds of technology are used for different uh, regions to uh, uh, fill out this gap. So here, just to give you an idea of what the scale is, uh, again, Alpha is the strength of this interaction relative to gravity. So alpha equals one would be a gravitational strength interaction. And lambda is the range of the force, this parameter lambda. And the yellow part, these excluded, the, everything in yellow is a region of value of alpha and a value of lambda, which is excluded by somebody or other's experiment. IUPUI's experiment of our group, uh, Professor Deck and I and Dennis Krauss and whatever, uh, at IUPUI, have done various experiments over the nanometer scale. So we own that distance scale, very clever modern physics experiments. And you can see sweeping down here, we've eliminated some things called gauge baryons, strange modulus. Don't even ask me to explain it because it would take up several hours. But in any case, the yellow figures say that certain theories which produce particles in this mass range are not allowed uh, by the experiments we've carried out and experiments by other people. Riverside uh, is Riley Newman and Stanford. There are lots of people doing that. Washington is Eric Adelberger and so on. All right, now, now, having said all of these things, so what is the Ed Bush paradox? The paradox is the inconsistency of these three statements. And this is a talk I gave at uh, 
in Hungary over the summer. 1919 was the 100th anniversary of the death of Artfurst. There were all sorts of celebrations all over Hungary, including one where I gave a talk, which essentially this is the subject of the talk. So what is the Artfurst paradox? The paradox in its basic form is that we have three statements, all of which we want to believe. One is that Artfurst did the experiment correctly. Two is that our reanalysis of the Artfurst experiment leading to the fifth force is also correct. And three is that the results of many, many experiments aimed at finding the fifth force suggested by one and two do not confirm its existence. So if you believe the Edfors, yeah? So the, has the Edfors, uh experiment been repeated? Well, that's... And is that number three? Many, uh, in three are those rep or modern repetitions of the Edfors experiment, yes. So why shouldn't we just assume it? Because, well, that's what the whole of the rest of the talk is about, okay? <laughs> I did not pay him to ask that question at this time, <laughs> nor did I pay Young Chen to ask his question when he did, okay? Well, I'd be happy to do so. Uh, so what I'm going to do is go in detail and explain why we think at first did the experiment right and why... Uh, our analysis is correct, and why all the experiments saying, saying they don't see anything are also correct. So it's not trivial, and, and the short answer to that question, Rhodes' question, which is very good, is that when you ask, did they repeat his experiment, they repeated the idea of his experiment. And the difference between the idea of his experiment and the actual experiment, that's what's really critical, and we want to talk about that. That was in part the subject of the thesis of my last student, Mike Medertes. Mike, are you here anywhere? Vanished, okay. So <laughs> he's afraid to be blamed by some of the guys over here. All right, so now we're gonna go in detail and describe what the, uh, what the issues are. Now, this is going in three parts because we're gonna answer Rudolph's question. The first and the most difficult part is to say why do we believe, uh, the most of the attention I'll devote is to why we believe this experiment was right. Uh, well, this is the apparatus. He was, of course, the great genius of this technology. Uh, although it looks like some primitive thing, the apparatus, is, as I said, is extremely sensitive. And uh, <coughs> as the experiment was written up, we know he took care to eliminate a lot of the problems. He was the world's expert, thermal gradients. He worried about air currents. If you read the papers, changes in gravity gradients. If you look around this building, there are, of course, gravity gradients because there are other buildings. But when it rains, there's also a change in the gravity gradient because water soaks into the ground outside. So you have to worry about all of these things. His technology uh, allowed for this effects arising from electromagnetic fields. Well, in these walls over here, you can't see, this is a triple-walled thing over here to keep both temperature and electrostatic effects uh, uh, at bay, so to speak. Uh, of course, a lot has to do with you know, many, many people dr drilling down and looking, at, uh, and looking at what could go wrong. I, I don't have time yet, but at the end, if there's a question, I had several interactions with Feynman over this thing. It turns out that this paper appeared about uh, two weeks before the tragedy of Challenger. So before, before that happened, uh, Feynman, uh, Feynman and I had some interactions. But I'll say the short answer is that even Feynman could not anything, find anything specifically wrong with it. So not that that proves anything, but we'll discuss that in more detail. Uh, now, there are subtle reasons why we believe this experiment was correct. And these are, the, these are the various comparisons that he did. But one of them, which is striking, because I didn't notice this until uh, somebody pointed it out. One of the experiments they did was a chemistry experiment. They took the, rea there's a reaction at the top. For some reason, this is pointed out to be some interesting reaction. Silver sulfate plus iron sulfate from silver in this other form, okay? Uh, what's interesting is shown by this picture over here. If you look at this picture, the silver is, and, and the, the solute is just sort of spread out in some way over here. By the time this reaction happens, the silver precipitates out of the bottom. And you may say, who cares about that? You care about that because this experiment is so sensitive that the fact that the silver on average collects over here and not spread out is enough to, uh, <clears throat> is enough to demonstrate a very large, very large signal in this experiment. That's how sensitive it was. And yet, they actually, but yet it's a chemical reaction, and from our viewpoint, as far as Barron knows, you should have, there should be no change at all. And that's in fact what happened. The, the change uh, in the uh, uh, fractional acceleration between the beginning and the end, delta cap, is zero in their experiment. And that could not have happened unless they realized this was going on. 
But of course they realized this was going on because their whole job was to talk about gravity gradients. That's how they made money selling equipment to oil companies. So the fact that it got all of this thing right is, uh, is, a, is a significant factor. Now here are the actual values they obtained for the various samples, magnalium platinum, brass platinum, sometimes a zero, sometimes not, copper sulfate to solution, snake good, which I'm gonna talk about in a minute, asbestos, copper sulfate crystals, copper sulfate solution, and so on. Now, okay, one of the things which is striking, yeah, I want it to be zero, because one of the things which is striking is this, can you put the light on here? Let's get this here. Ah, wonderful. I wanna show you two of the materials that they use, okay? This over here is copper sulfate crystals. Some of you have been in chemistry laboratory, see copper sulfate crystals. The other material over here is uh, something some of you have seen before, a courtesy of uh, a local jeweler. This is Ralph Provoznik. This is platinum. Look at these two things. You can hardly find two pieces of matter which have, very, which have more dissimilar properties, platinum, Electric conductivity, thermal conductivity, density, there's no known property, no classical property which these two things have in common. And, but these two things happen to be uh, samples which those guys used. Okay, let's go, to the, go back to the slides. Now, this is striking. Uh, if you look at these two materials which I've just shown you, copper sulfate crystals and platinum, uh, courtesy of uh, Mr. Provoznik, they have absolutely nothing in common classically, but by an extraordinary miracle, they have almost exactly the same baryon number to mass ratios. They agree to parts in 10 to the fifth. So if this theory of a baryon number force, this is going to answer part of Rugo's question, if this is not a trivial accident, then it should be that these two totally different objects should have the same acceleration, or the acceleration difference should be zero. Now, unfortunately, they didn't directly compare copper sulfate crystals and platinum, but they compare both to copper. So if you combine the two data, you find this, that their measured difference between copper sulfate crystals and platinum is well within zero, exactly what you would predict from the fact they have essentially the same baryonomic to mass ratio. It's very hard to think, in fact, nobody's ever suggested any mechanism, unless it's just you know, something come out of the heavens without any motivation, that would have produced this effect. So they have the very same barrier number, predict the same uh, delta kappa zero. In fact, delta kappa is zero within their sensitivity. It's hard to look at this, in addition to the pattern of all the lines, and say, whatever, I mean, it's just an accident. In my world, you know, eight or nine different accidents is actually a real effect. Now, one of the other materials they used is something you can, I uh, invite you to look at, is snake wood. Uh, this is a piece of snake wood. Unfortunately, when I was doing this work, uh, I was on sabbatical at the University of Washington, which has a very big, well, state of Washington has a very big forestry effort, as we do at Purdue. Uh, and I was uh, given a lot of help by these guys. Snake wood is apparently the world's, one of the world's densest woods. You'll feel free to come up and touch it. It's extremely expensive. And uh, when we went to uh, do our analysis, we wanted to know exactly what snake wood was. Well, they told us what it was. We found out that it's used for making violin bows, if you're rich enough to own a violin bow made out of that. And so we went and bought this from a violin bow maker. Seattle's, of course, a very big uh, cultural center. And we sent this out for analysis. The theory group there paid for the analysis. And when it came back, it was, uh, this is it. It fit in exactly on the line along with everything else. So they picked a random bunch of stuff. We don't know why. Copper sulfate crystals, platinum for whatever reason. Snake wood. Uh, I will tell something funny about snake wood, which is, uh, since I like to have a sense of humor, I was on sabbatical with my student, Carrick Talmadge. This was his PhD thesis. And he decided to evaluate the baryon number to mass ratio of all the woods that are not all the different kinds of wood that's known. Um, and he sat down, he made a huge table out of this. And uh, it turns out, first of all, which makes it clear that barrier number to mass ratio is something unusual, that all of the different woods, balsa, whatever it is, snake wood, pine, all have very nearly the same barrier number to mass ratio, and that number is essentially indistinguishable from the barrier number to mass ratio of cellulose, which is the major ingredient of, of wood. And so it's interesting that the, if you want to know, incidentally, or, if you want to know, incidentally, what the barrier number to mass ratio is your favorite tree, here it is. 
when we wrote up this paper for review, Carrick Talmadge wanted to put in a table of the barrier number to mass ratios of all of 20 different kinds of trees, okay? And I said then, this is going to annals of physics. This is a high energy thing. Why do you want the barrier number to mass ratio of trees in this paper? The, edit, the referee's gonna laugh at you. He said, come on, Ephraim, do it. I said, all right, all right. The referee will reject it and so on. Well, the referee didn't reject it. So if you go to table nine of our paper in Annals of Physics, and you want to know the barrier number to mass ratio of your favorite pine or oak or whatever, there it is, ladies and gentlemen, okay? Our service contribution to society. So <laughs> hopefully it's more than that, but at least that, that's true. So Carrick turned out to be right, and uh, I'm glad to say it's table nine in, in Annals of Physics and so on. All right, now. Yes. So the mass ratio should be a constant. It's an intrinsic constant. It's a constant for any particular material, like platinum. But I'm sorry. What is? What? What's? I'm sorry. What's the question? So most of the materials you would have a proton and yeah. nucleus, right? Nucleus, proton, neutrons, right? Yeah. And uh, their mass are fixed. Yeah. So your, so your, so, so your mass is proportional to the number of proton and neutrons, right? Now if you add them up and uh, you take a ratio, you come out with the number. So no, 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 no. Uh, okay. The let me let me ask you a question. <laughs> let me the answer. No. The barrier number to mass ratio reflects the fact, and it's going to be a, an upcoming picture, but I'll say right now. I'm going to show you a plot of barrier number to mass across the periodic table. You, the, the observation he's making is correct. That basically, it, uh, barrier number to mass ratio of everything is close to one, but those differences are exactly what this experiment measures, because iron, which is the most tightly bound thing, has the biggest barrier number to mass ratio, and hydrogen has the smallest. But those small differences are exactly what this experiment is sensitive to. So you're all working to the difference between adding, the, the difference between the actual barrier number to mass ratio and one. That was your question, okay? So small difference are exactly what those uh, results sense it to. You'll see it in a minute. Well, the difference is the, the electrons. So the electrons are the same number as the protons. So exactly, right. All right, so let's go to the next slide. Let's see if this I want to. the next slide. What? We're here. This is the next slide. This isn't it? Yes. Uh, oh, okay, here it is. All right. <laughs> Uh, we'll, we'll discuss. Uh, I know what the question is. We're going to uh, come to it in a few seconds. All right, so here it is. Now we're going to talk about why it, what, the, what discussion, what this boils down to, and bring in the interaction between Erdvorsch and Einstein. Uh, one of the points we emphasize is that it is clear on the one hand that Einstein was inf uh, influenced by Erdvorsch. In his famous paper in 1915, he cites Erdvorsch pointing out that little objects do, in fact, fall at the same rate in a gravitational field. Now here's the interesting, uh, interesting result. When you actually look at his results, forget about the interpretation that we're giving in terms of barrier number, uh, you see that of this thing, seven out of the 11 data sets actually aren't delta cap equals zero, aren't really uh, overlapping. And this one datum, this one thing, just comparing water and copper, differs from zero by five standard deviations. Now that one datum by itself uh, if you had a five sigma effect now, you'd say, well, I'd publish it, and that would be a real, a real discovery. But the whole of this thing, all of these taken together on that plot, is really an eight standard deviation effect. So the question is this. Erdvorsch got, all, Erdvorsch got all these results in 1908. He never published them in his lifetime, and he died in 1919. So the question is, why not? And the indications are from a lot of sources and a lot of things we're, we've put together is that Erdvorsch wasn't happy with the fact that his results weren't as close to zero as they should be, and as Einstein assumed they were, and so on and so on. So on the one hand, Einstein was clearly influenced by Erdvorsch. They knew each other, they were kind of buddies, uh, Erdvorsch being the most senior one. On the other hand, it's clear that Erdvorsch himself wasn't entirely, there are lots of indications like this over here, that Erdvorsch himself wasn't happy with the fact that his results didn't exactly look, look at zero. Now, he had more than 10 years of his life to look at his data over and over again. General relativity came out and so on. And he never withdrew his paper, but he never published it either. And that's one of those puzzles about the history of this whole process, why he didn't publish it, why he didn't withdraw, what he thought about it. His co-authors in the beginning of the paper that was written up after he died said, I want to do it over again, blah, 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 blah. But it was never done. And so this is the... This is a suggestion, among others, that Edfish himself may have been unhappy with the fact that his data 
didn't exactly agree with the predictions of general relativity and suggests that he must have checked this and gives us more confidence he may have done this correctly. Now, uh, great. This is an answer to uh, your question over here about materials. I'm plotting on this uh, graph over here the barrier number to mass ratio uh, of all the elements. Let's see if we can, I'll just leave it this way. The barrier number to mass ratio of all the elements, the red lines refer to the samples, the elements that actually existed. Uh, hydrogen over here, platinum over here, silver, copper, iron. Look at the different elements, of course. This actually peaks over here. It's sort of obliterated by the writing. Uh, it peaks at iron, which has the largest baryon number to mass ratio because for a given number of baryons, it's the most tightly bound. So here are different samples. It's uh, interesting to us that he had no reason to plot it in this way. But in any case, he's picked elements from way across the periodic table. And this gives you some idea that it's not just an accident, that there's a pattern here. And what's interesting about this pattern is there's no physical quantity which has the shape of this. The shape is unfortunately obliterated here, just smoothly goes over. There's no physical quantity which has the same shape, which could have reproduced the effect of the baryon number to mass ratio that actually was measured by Erdfusch. And that's part of the reason why one thinks this is not just an accident. We can't think of anything like density or electromagnetic conductivity or whatever else you want to think of, which has the same variation across the periodic table. When we tabulate the baryon number to mass ratio, incidentally, we weight it by all the different uh, isotopes of an element, where the element has a circle over here that has no stable isotopes, but basically we've calculated for every single isotope and all of its, uh, and all of the ones contributing to anywhere in any experiment. Now, so let's talk about the evidence. This goes back to Rudrow's question. Why do we think this experiment was done correctly? Okay, well, uh, care was taken to exclude temperature effects and so on. It's, it's built that way. There was a correction. We just talked about this. There was a correction, subtle correction of gravity gradients. That means they understood gravity gradients and so on. This one datum, the copper sulfate versus copper, gives a five standard deviation effect. That by itself would be a surprise. And then the real question is what I just talked about. Why did Edwish not publish his results between 1908 and 1919, even though by his own statement, his own statement, he improved on the results of a previous experiment by Bessel by a factor of 300. He was 300 times better than the previous guy. In our time, nobody would not publish a result that was that much better. OK, now, now we're going to talk about the experimental situation and answer how have people done these things in modern times. It's, uh, well, the first experiment that was the one, the one that motivated us, is called the Airy method due to Stacy. So they simply measure gravity down a borehole in uh, uh, Australia. Uh, you know, in naive gravity, you're only influenced by the stuff that's interior to you and so on. So they were measuring gravity at uh, one kilometer and at the surface, and they got some anomalous result. That motivated us to do our analysis and so on. Uh, later, this was found to be an error, but nonetheless, we were motivated and we uh, this is the, sort of the first one that got this whole uh, episode going. Next one. All right. Now, uh, one of the things we talked about, there are two ways of looking for non-Newtonian gravity. One is to look for something that depends on the masses, and the other is just to look for things which depend on R in different ways, okay? Now, this is, uh, these R tests depend on the range of uh, whatever the force is, and to understand that, you understand that uh, an experiment to, uh, done over the size of this room tests theories where lambda is on the size of this room. Uh, each value of lambda has to be tested in its own regime, okay? So look at the regime of a uh, uh, solar system. Uh, here's an example. The precession of perihelion of Mercury, the fact that the long axis of Mercury points in the correct, rotates in the correct direction, something Einstein pointed out in uh, 2016. Uh, it's given by this formula over here. If lambda, if we include the range of the force lambda over here, it depends on the nature, on the range of the force and so on. So by measuring the precession of perihelion of mercury and seeing that it agrees with general relativity without any more stuff, sets a limit on the strength of this potential new interaction alpha. It's characteristic of these many experiments which have a value of lambda in there that uh, they're particularly most sensitive for some value of lambda. It kind of always looks like this. And... Uh, this will be a sort of a prototype of other experiments that we see. So one experiment is just planetary precession. You know the astronomers are continually improving on the precession of the perihelion mercury. Another is just the, uh, Kepler's law, t squared over a cubed. This is Kepler's law in somebody's uh, notation. 
uh, the cube of the distance divided by the square of the period should be a constant, but if Newtonian gravity isn't correct and has an additional contribution depending on this range, then this number itself won't be a constant, it'll be something else. And so many, many groups did that. Talmadge was my graduate student whom I mentioned, he was part of a Fizrev letter on this, and many, many of us have done things like this. So if you test the precession of the perihelion of Mercury and a lot of other analogous planetary tests, you set a limit on this, and that's part of what goes into the data set. Uh, well, this is a, a very clever observation due to my friend Riley Newman at UC Riverside, who noted the following. Suppose you have an apparatus that kind of looks like this, but it sits inside a cylinder which goes back and forth like this without touching it, of course. Uh, it's almost like a, uh, it's almost as would be the case inside a perfectly spherical object, except for endpoints, there should be no force on this thing. Slow down. There should be no force on this if I move a cylinder around it, uh, assuming Newtonian gravity alone. So you can use this thing to set a limit on Newtonian gravity variations over the centimeter scale by moving this uh, base over here back and forth, containing a cylinder and so on. It's a very clever experiment of Riley Newman, and over the distance scale of centimeters, this is the standard result now. Uh, all right. This is the one experiment that survived so far, which has not been withdrawn in the literature, and we don't know whether it's an accident or whether it's a clue over here. It was indeed the first experiment that reported a result in Fizzer of Letters, and uh, it's due to Peter T. Berger at Brookhaven. He has a, a hollow copper sphere floating in water, and this whole apparatus, cooled and heated and all that, sits in a can, and it sits at Palisades, New Jersey. For those New Yorkers like me, the Palisades are right at the... Uh, for, uh, on the Hudson River and the Jersey side of uh, uh, the Hudson River. And the idea is this. If you have uh, an object, let's say copper over here, which has a different view from you from the water, you cannot make the uh, copper sphere buoyant in the presence of two different forces of different range. That's a simple thing to prove, but I won't discuss it unless there's a question. Uh, it, in simple English, it boils down to the fact that the gravity field and some presumed fifth force field are different vector fields. You can't make two vector fields line up with only one parameter, which is a ratio of the densities of the copper and the water. Stated simply, that's it. So this experiment was the first. It showed an effect. It has not been withdrawn. And, and the question is, is this a real effect? Is there something in the way he did this experiment that's actually a clue? And that's partly answer to Rudolph's question. Or is itself a glitch for some other reason? All right, this is a picture of the Washington experiment. Um, uh, by Adelberger et al. You can hardly see it, but all you want to see is that there's a lot of complexity in here, essentially rebuilding this apparatus, but with many, many, many more sensitive uh, corrections, essentially making the test masses, which look the same to the outside, but have different compositions, orienting them, depending on how you position the rods, as a better version with essentially four masses doing essentially the same thing that, uh, uh, Adelberger that uh, at first did. Now, the answer to Rudrow's question is we don't know whether having the better apparatus that he did over here uh, is why he doesn't see a signal, or maybe he's washed out a signal that was present in, in the other experiment for some other reason. That's an interesting question. But this, to answer your question, this is what a modern experiment looked like. I think there's some other pictures of it as well. All right, so here is the same app. This is that apparatus shown in more detail. Obviously, it's polished. You don't have to worry about all that, and the masses sit on these turntables over here. Uh, Adelberg has done many, many versions of this. He's an extremely careful experimentalist, and there's no evidence from his experiment of something like what uh, Edgefors did. All right, this is now the our experiment at IUPUI. Now we're down to the nanometer scale. Uh, in this case over here, a ball attached to a, 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 something moving it back and forth moves back and forth over a substrate with two different materials. So it's again a composition dependent experiment. And if there is a, a difference of composition of interaction strength between the gold covered silicon sphere and those two things at the bottom, then it's going to create, you know, up and down. Uh, force on the cantilever, and it's going to drive it at the resonant frequency. So you move this up and down, slides across cantilever, and if you drive it at the resonant frequency, you'll get a signal. And uh, of course, we've not seen anything in that experiment. So this is one of the experiments that sets the limits on very, very small distances. Here it is, uh, the micron scale and so on. The separation is in the nanometer scale. So we set some of the best limits at that range. Now, given this is what I showed before, but this is given again. 
Uh, the yellow part is excluded, and it's IUPUI. These are our two experiments, uh, showing you different parts of it. I don't have to go through this in detail. Uh, uh, again, filling in part of the world, saying we don't see any composition-dependent effects going down to the nanometer scale. Next. Edfush wouldn't it, where Ed, the Edfush experiment isn't plotted on this experiment. It's just us. Uh, well, the different the difficulty with Edfush experiment is somehow you don't know what what his actual source is. In all these experiments, you know what the source is. If you assume it's the Earth, then it's uh, whatever the radius of the Earth is over here. But it would be uh, in terms of its strength, to be somewhere in this range over here. Yeah. Uh, all right, here again, a bunch of limits from different experiments. You see large parts of the parameter space are excluded. We're down to very small numbers now for certain distance scales. This is like uh, the uh, solar system scale, 10 to the minus 9 relative to gravity. You're talking about very, very small uh, forces if they exist at all. Now, all right, so now we're going to talk about, just run on time, we're going to talk about how is it possible, given the overwhelming lack of uh, support for the experiment, for us to believe that experts did it right. Okay, so what do we believe? Uh, we presented three different possibilities, the statements that the Edfish experiment is right, that our analysis is right, and that uh, the experiments are also right, not seeing the effect. I think, our guess is, and Mike Meditis said, we just submitted a paper on this to FizRev, we think that our experiment, though it's actually correct, uh, is too limited. And now, what we did by luck was to write down the simplest theory which could explain the data, and those ex that theory did explain the data. On the other hand, you can write down a very large class of theories uh, which also could explain the data, and that was in part what Mike's thesis. Joseph, are you here? It, my, he, Joseph Berto is my current graduate student. Mike Medertiz was his predecessor. With the help of what we now call the Berto function and other things, we're considering more general mechanisms which could embody the same things that made the Edfish experiment work, but uh, built on the fact that we may be washing out an effect by looking in the wrong direction. Okay, so what it says over here at the bottom is what the clue is. In fact, it's likely that any interaction whose charge is barrier number B would work, not necessarily the simple formula that we wrote down when we published the paper. Well, I'm not sure what I mean, I'm, uh, that could be another explanation of what's going on. Well, the optimistic on his error bars. Okay, so let's go. Okay, I'll answer it. Edfush was the world's expert in gravity at his time. His error bars are completely consistent with the data that he published. Okay, we have all sorts of results of his data. Everybody's checked that. His error bars are not too big and not too small. But and is this experiment ruled out by these experiments? No, that's what I'm saying. The whole, the point, no, I want to make the message clear. This goes back to Rudolph's question. Nobody has taken his apparatus and built it and done everything exactly the way they did, okay? People have tested the idea. They've tested our formula. The idea, nobody has gone back and tested his, done his experiment his way and so on. People have tested, of course, that's not interesting. People were interested in the fact that there's a presumed fifth force with certain characteristics. None of the experiment, or very few of the experiments, in fact, none actually repeated the Edfush experiment. People tested the idea. We could have written down the wrong formula, the wrong representation of what we think Edfush did, and in that other picture, something else could have been true. So we're, we're, it's, if there's a force coupling to barrier number, but it's coming from a, well, here it is. We're going to talk about it in a minute. If there's a force coupling to barrier number, it doesn't come from a mountain. It doesn't come from a bunch of lead bricks. It doesn't come from anything in the room. It comes from dark matter, for example. None of the experiments that have been done to date would be bearing on that. That's the question. So it's something in the, the way at first did the experiment, which we don't understand. But it's nonetheless an astonishing coincidence, if nothing else, at the ridiculously small level that all of his data plotted in that way give you an eight standard deviation effect. If you can create a theory that will make that happen by accident, I'd like to hear it. But that's what the surprise is. That you, well, we're not PIAC, we're just plotting his. We analyze something using 
No, it's simply saying, let's plot his data as a function of this thing. That's not P accurate, we simply, let's plot it. He never plotted it, so we're not reanalyzing it, we're just plotting it versus a new theory. All right, let me go on to the next, uh, next thing. All right, so here, uh, so let's talk about, and here's an interesting example. Well, this answers Francis' question in some way. Uh, the simple experiments that have been done take a very simple expression for what the signal would be in their experiment. In reality, the, experiment, the, the details of the experiment are much more complicated. Uh, there are many, many more terms which could enter. This is what Mike Minerty showed. There are many more interactions which entered to which these experiments are not sensitive. I'm going to say that again. If you write down a general theory, which Mike did in his PhD in a brilliant way, there are many, many more terms over there. Just the Edwash experiment, which I just described, is sensitive just a small number, but there are other terms in here, which these guys ignore, don't pay attention to, whatever. It is possible that somehow or other, there's a source due to dark matter, or whatever it is, where these terms are really important. And that's part, we, partly what Joseph was working on with our group. But you can see, this is one line here, the many, many more interactions which nobody else worries about. So maybe in those interactions, uh, because the experiments are what they are, that's the source of the effect. But that's the part of the paradox. Okay, so here's a resolution which addresses part of what Francis' question is. Well, what could the answer be? There could be other things like baryonic neutrinos, okay? That would not have shown up in a lot of these experiments, period. A baryonic force is activated or catalyzed by the Earth's rotation. Nobody's looked at that. There could be a new kind of gravitational force interference with a new force. There could be new non-Yukawa baryonic interactions. All of these are potential interactions to which current experiments are simply not sensitive because they're designed to look for something specific. So uh, scalar vector theories and so on. Now, there could be something about the Earthrush experiment that's hiding in plain sight. What is it about it that we're not paying attention, which looks like a sort of incidental effect? And there could be a combination of puzzles and so on, which we don't know about, which somehow conspire to give this uh, uh, extraordinary correlation. Give me the next slide. He wants to know why people don't do it. It's a fundamental theorem of people that they're lazy. So that experiment, that experiment took four years to do, doing the way they did it. And so by automating it this way and simplifying it somehow, what, so the answer to all these questions is the people who repeat the experiment are not interested in repeating the Earthwatch experiment. They're interested in testing that there's a new idea called a fair force with certain characteristics. So they weren't really interested in repeating that, except to verify or criticize the idea of the new force, which is put forward to explain why Edward saw what they did, okay? That's four years as opposed to four months, as uh, it gets explains why nobody's done it. Let's see, is there anything, the next slide? Okay, now, forget the Nobel Prize. I know this is somebody wrote a story there. Go to the X-17. This is sort of this X-17 particle. All right, so there are people who've discovered a particle called X-17, you've all read about it in the news. The question is, uh, it just doesn't seem to couple the barrier number, maybe there's something about this. This does have the right mass range to be useful in certain kinds of interactions. Uh, is it possible there is some other particle like this to which at first would have been sensitive precisely because he wasn't killing himself to get rid of forces about which he knew nothing and we don't know. Uh, and so the answer is more work has to be done on this. Uh, theoretically, and that's it. I think that's the last slide. Let's see. Yeah. All right. Now, John, you want to ask me a question? <laughs> no. Yes, about that paper. <laughs> All right. I asked, I asked John to ask me the question about this paper. This is the paper by Lee and Yang. See if you can bring her. All right. While he's get, digging it up, I'm going to answer the question. Lee and Yang wrote this paper in 1955, which raised the question about whether there's a force where the origin is baryon number. Uh, uh, that's it. Now, it turns out by coincidence, about a week after the paper was published in the New York Times, uh, T.D. Lee himself was visiting the University of Washington. So I got a chance to talk to him. And uh, he began by congratulating the group and all that stuff. And then uh, we talked about the physics. And then I asked him kind of sheepishly, uh, why didn't you guys do what we did? Why didn't you, instead of just writing down a limit on the coupling kinds, why didn't you plot the data the way we did? And the interesting historical question is, he, he was laughing, he said, we were in the middle of studying parity non-conservation of weak interactions. As all of you know, that's the left-handed, right-handed asymmetry in the weak interactions, which we now know. 
But when he was doing this, most people thought that was a crazy idea. Why would the weak interactions discriminate between left-handedness and right-handedness? It looked like a waste of time. So he said, well, you know, we just took out a day or two to write this paper. The interesting thing was, had they taken out another day or two to do what we did, they would have seen the same effect, for better or worse. And uh, it's, we, we agreed to that. He would have been in, perhaps motivated to not worry about left-handed, right-handed asymmetry, which nobody believed in, but to worry about a gravity effect, which apparently was right under his nose. So that, would have, that little historical tweak could have changed the history of weak interactions had they just taken out one more day to do what we did. So it's, a, it's an amusing speculation, which a lot of people have noted as well, but it is what it is. And well, two years later, they won the Nobel Prize. So, so the answer is maybe, maybe, the, maybe to do that, you have to make the right decision at the right time. And I just thought this is a, an interesting story about that. Oh, that's not what? <laughs> the, 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 uh, yes, Li and Yang. Li and Yang proposed, uh, proposed this, Madame Wu did the experiment, and uh, Li and Yang won the Nobel Prize, yeah. Questions? Max. We all know that Newtonian uh, law is wrong. It's not wrong. Uh, it is wrong. <laughs> <laughs> it, is wrong. <laughs> it is wrong to the point that there is no force of gravity. All the bodies move freely, but in a space and curved by masses. And that has been tested on very different scales. For example, with modern atomic clocks, if you leave one on the table and one on the floor sure. overnight, yeah. overnight, they will be off by what general relativity predicts, and that's a test to the precision that of the minus something like 14. I agree, absolutely. It's, and it's the same scale. Yeah, I, I understand, that's part of the, yeah, we agree that general relativity works, and part of the question is why does it work you know, given, given the, well, we know now that it works. That's not an issue. The question is, going back, what would have happened if Einstein didn't believe in the Earthwish experiment? Yeah, the, it's, a, it's an independent question. General relativity works, it has nothing to do with a potential fifth force and so on. That's all. I mean, uh, it's, there's no contradiction there. <clears throat> At least I don't see a contradiction. Any other? Yeah. So in a slide after this, you have a plot of, it's the periodic table plot where you have the um, number on the periodic table versus the variant uh, yeah. mesh ratio. Um, and that, the shape of that graph, uh, there's a, Striking similarity to the graph of activation, er, binding energy, yeah, to atomic number. Uh, is there any... That is what it is. That's exactly what it is. The bare number to mass ratio differs from one by exactly binding energy. That's what that graph is. So, uh, it's another way of saying the same thing, but that's, uh, somebody else pointed this out. An atom roughly is the, uh, you know, number of neutrons times the mass of neutron, number of protons, number of atoms plus the minus the binding energy, okay? That's exactly that curve. So the reason you get different B over mu ratios is that for the same, that uh, when you scale it, uh, bar number to mass is not exactly one because the difference in the binding energy, that's exactly what that curve is, yeah. Another question? Okay, let's thank our speaker again. <laughs>